um, now that we have that uh, little fright there. Uh, good morning. I hope everybody watching at home and obviously you that are in person, thank you so much for coming. Um, today we're going to be, obviously we're going to be in the book of Proverbs as we have been uh, in the last couple of, si- uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I know that many of you are probably, especially at home, are getting tired of seeing me. Uh, it seems like I've been on stage a lot lately. So next week you will not see me. Dr. Pross is going to take over and uh, he's going to teach for us next Sunday. Um, so as all of you already know and you've gotten accustomed to, if you do not have your, um, uh, a, a guide that you're following at home, don't worry. Um, just follow along as we read through. So we're going to start out with our first thoughts. There's a lot of discussion today, so I hope we can, we can get a lot of discussion going. So uh, our first thoughts go like this. Uh, children enjoy pleasing the people they love. They know no boundaries when it comes to showing their affection to their parents, grandparents, teachers at school, or neighbors across the street. Their love prompts them to give a hug, a kiss, or a smile. It also causes them to look for ways to please. They'll try to fix breakfast for their parents, sing a new song that they learned for their grandparents, and take gifts to their teachers. When you were a child, how did you try to please the people you loved? What do you think? I know uh, uh, when I was a kid, it was still kind of popular to bring an apple to the teacher. I don't know that it's popular to do that anymore, um, necessarily. Um, but, or little gifts and those kind of things. I think we've, we've done gifts, you know, throughout the years um, to, to please teachers, you know. Sherman's laughing because he's like, that's, it. that's my way of like slipping it under the table to get a better grade for my child. Yeah, come on. Oh, not showing up. Oh, that's how he pleased. Sherman pleased his teachers by not showing up. I get that. I can understand that. Oh, how sweet. Robin would get fresh flowers. Wow. Okay. How, how about anybody else? Anybody else? Just a hug. You're a hugger. No one could ever tell that. I don't know how we would ever have assumed that. No, no, that's great, right? You know, sometimes you just need a hug, right? Um, I don't know if that's manly to say, but sometimes you just do. You know, you just need to know that people care. And I think we're so wrapped up in today's, you know, I got to do this, I got to do that, that we miss the little opportunities that God, that God gives us. Um, it says, what difference did it make for you or make to you? Um, the, the little things that, well, I mean, what have you done lately the, to show your spouse that you care? I mean, f- uh, let's take love out of it for just a second, but just that you care, right? Oh, all right. Yeah, okay. And I'm sorry, Robin, you said purple, purple hold peas. Black eyed peas? Is that what we're talking about? Oh, okay. All right. So, sure, there, there could be little things like that, right? Um, I know I, I'm a big, uh, anybody like strawberry rhubarb? I love strawberry rhubarb. It's like one of my favorite pies ever. And so my, um, my daughter, as we were working, I guess we were in South Haven, as we're going through one of these, uh, it's a store called Sprouts. I don't know if you've ever been there. Um, they, has, they have like, kind of like a Whole Foods, but just a little bit better in my opinion. Um, so she was looking through and she's like, hey, rhubarb. And so I never find rhubarb anywhere. So anytime I find it, I, it's like an excuse for me to, all right, where's the strawberries? And time for me to make something, right? Make a strawberry rhubarb. Um, you remember the uh, Perkins? Perkins used to have like the best pies. And they had a strawberry rhubarb pie. That is neither here nor there about anything. But for some reason, I got talking about strawberry rhubarb. Uh, squirrel. All right, anyway, let's move on to today's lesson. So our guide has uh, quite a few uh, chapters of review. It actually has f- chapters 15 through 22. Um, don't worry for you at home. I'm not going to go through all those chapters. Um, and our pastor would say amen to that as well, I'm sure. Um, the idea of people that live for God and also those who don't is kind of what you find in those, in those chapters. We also see this type of one-liner, if you will. And I don't mean one-liner in the funny sense of the word, um, just that one-liner in, is in wisdom that we see is in the form of one thought or one sentence at a time. 
In chapters 15 and 16, we see Solomon showing the value of pleasing the Lord, such as what we find in the verses we're going to go over actually in today's lesson. Uh, And then that's where we're going to focus a lot of our attention is in Proverbs 15 and 16 for today's um, lesson. I want to go over just really briefly on some of these other chapters, though. In chapter 18, Solomon talks about the power of the tongue. Hmm, curious, isn't that? Do you believe that the tongue has any real power? Well, if the tongue didn't have any power, we wouldn't see all this craziness in today's world, right? We see a lot of crazy. Uh, with the advent of, you know, and the advent of, of social media, everybody thinks that they've got to give their two cents, right? Um, and it seems like the louder you are, the the more they think they'll you'll be heard. I mean, I, I just don't, I don't understand where we got to this point where the more I yell and scream, the better I am. It, it doesn't make any sense to me, right? Um, and if the, if the tongue has real power, if it does, why are we not better watch takers of it? You know, I think that starts in the church, doesn't it? I think that if we're growing in our faith, then we should be growing in our reluctance to speak out of turn or to speak when it's not necessary. Um, A lot of us, we have, you know, sometimes my wife and I, we kind of joke around that my wife, I love her to death, but she has a, a way of just blurting it out, right? And just saying things, right? And then I look at her and go, Katrina... No, no, not the time we're playing. But it's true. Well, yeah, it's true, but, you know, right? She just has a way of doing that. Um, But in chapter 19 and going through 22, we find many nuggets of wisdom dealing with with everything from family to friendship to husbands, how we treat our wives, and even to how we respond to the poor, which is interesting to me because I believe it was, wasn't it Jesus himself who said in Matthew, what you've done for the least of these, right? I think you find that in Matthew 25. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into our verses. So uh, Proverbs 15, 33 and 16, 8. We're going to do a lot of jumping around in 15 and 16. Um, so bear with us as we go through that. So if you don't have your, your guide at home, go ahead and open your Bibles to chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 33. So in 15, verse 33, it says, The fear of the Lord is what wisdom teaches, and humility comes before honor. So what does the fear of the Lord... Does the fear of the Lord is what wisdom teaches mean to you? The fear of the Lord is what wisdom teaches. I believe the answer to that question lies in the second half of that verse. And humility comes before honor. So what does it mean to be humble? And I don't mean a fake humility either. Gosh, there's so much of that right now. So many people that want to boast that they're humble. Listen, can I tell you something? If you boast that you're humble, you're not. Let's just, let's just be honest about it. You know, I like to keep it real. I just, you know, I'm just, it is what it is. If you're, a, you're a boasting that you're a very humble and full of humility, then most likely you are not humble and full of humility. Okay? That is something I believe we as Christians need to constantly always work on. Now, there are times, I think, in each of our lives, there are things that each of us, we're all given, I believe wholeheartedly, that we're all given different gifts and specialities that make us unique, right? Um, This idea that we've got right now where everybody needs to be the same and there's no uniqueness, I wholeheartedly disagree with because I do not believe that God created us that way. Otherwise, why would we each have unique fingerprints? There's not one that's the same. Not one. Right? People and I could compare and we like, nope, not even close, right? Because God made us to be unique. But sometimes in our uniqueness, we can have an inflated ego in certain, in certain things, right? I think that we all have some sort of pride in our lives, whether we like to admit it or not. But you know, there's one being we cannot be prideful in front of. God. The creator of the universe. Boy, that put that in perspective here. 
You know, when I think of the God that I serve and how he created everything that I see in nature, yeah, that makes me kind of go down a few notches, right? Um, Because I didn't have anything to do with that, right? Fearing the Lord means we understand our place and his as well. So the fear of the Lord is what wisdom teaches and humility comes before honor. So look at chapter 16 and then verse 8. There it says, better a, little with righte- better a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. I, you know, I think we could agree that money takes care of a lot of issues, doesn't it? Or could. After all, we need money to do a lot of things, right? To buy a home, to, you know, or to pay our rent, or our car notes, or our, the list could go on and on and on and on, right? Um, to provide comfortably for our families. But what is this verse saying here? Better a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. Solomon, I think, is saying that it is better for you and I to live with little to our name and have righteousness than to live with great income and injustice. I think this is where many of us Christians lose ourselves. This might explain all the so-called ministers in today's day and age of the, what we call the prosperity gospel. When we look to ourselves, we may be disillusioned to believe that prosperity means great wealth or lots of things. You know, money has a way of corrupting us. Whether you're Christian or not, it has a way of corrupting us. And I think that's where I, I wholeheartedly believe that there's a lot of ministers out there that in the beginning were very genuine about what they felt and what they believed. And then as they grew in wealth and grew in power and influence, it became, to, it became an addiction of sorts. You know, we like to so oftentimes think of things, addictions as the, you know, drugs, alcohol, those kind of things. But listen, addiction comes in all different types and forms, right? That's okay. That's maybe that's just the easy stuff to, you know, point out. But there are other kinds of addiction. And can I be completely frank with you? The Southern Baptists are, are known for one of these. We have an addiction to food, right? In many cases, right? That's why we have so many potlucks and we have so many dinners and all that kind of stuff. And and how many times do we go, well, I'm going to go back for a little bit more. There's so many desserts. Listen, I'm the first to blame on that, right? Absolutely the first to blame. See, we need to be brave enough to ask ourselves where our heart lies. Is it more important to be right with God or right in the eyes of man? I think that's where we lose our way. We get to this influence becomes such an addictive thing that we, we get more and more influence or we get more and more power, more and more wealth, and, and we just got to have more and more and more. And our heart turns to getting that, that, those things instead of being right with God. I think our pastor even said in the sermon here that there's nothing more important than what? A right relationship with God. Through his son, Jesus. So, because that is really what it is, isn't it? Who are we trying to impress? God or our own inflated egos? To prove to the world that we are something. Ironically, in this world where we want everybody to be the same, where you see person after person on social media begging to be different. You know, I have, I tell you, I have a relative in my family um, that I've always admired greatly. And uh, although I I seriously doubt she knows it because I don't see her very often. She is one that has lived in um, what I would consider in poverty. Um, She's lived, her and her family have lived very, very poor, poorly. But every time I'm around her, I'm uplifted by her because she has such a joy. She just has such a joy for life. And she's gone through some really difficult times with her and her her family. Um, Some mental illnesses with her kids and just some, some really hard things. But yet she has never, in my 
and what I've seen, at least, never lost sight of where her heart lies. She has very little. And that's what kind of Solomon says, isn't it? Better a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. She's the first one to praise God for what little she has. Where does our heart lie? What do we seek after? See, what most do not understand that I believe she has is that great wealth is not what contends the soul. Only a right relationship with Jesus can satisfy. And Solomon even says, especially when that income comes from what? Injustice. So maybe Solomon, if he were right here, might ask, what is more important to you? Justice or profit? God's way or your way? You know, it's so easy for us to be in the church and to say, oh no, I'm, I'm going after God's way. But do we? You know, the older I get, the more I realize that I need to have that reflection in the mirror and I need to have God point out the fallacies that I have. I need to point out, have God point out to me where I need to grow in my faith, grow in my relationship so that I might become more and more like Jesus. I'll never be like Jesus because there's, I, I'm not, I can't be perfect, but I can be more and more like him, right? All right, Proverbs 16. Let's move over to that one. Proverbs 16, actually starting in verse 1, is where it has a start in this section here. In verse 1, it says, The reflections of the heart belong to mankind, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And then it jumps down to verse 4. So go down to verse 4 through 5 with me. The Lord has prepared everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. Everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Be assured... He will not go unpunished. Yikes. That kind of scares me a little bit. I don't know about you. Because there have been times where my heart has been proud. And it says everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Anybody ever have a big plan that you've spent maybe weeks, months preparing for? We're in the process right now. This is one of the reasons why I will be gone next week. Um, I have two things happening. My niece is getting married uh, in Joplin, Missouri, and so I'm eager to see her um, her off and, you know, uh, enjoy that celebration. But for a couple of years now, I've told you that my mother-in-law, she lives in a floodplain, and so we have to, we had to build her house very high. Uh, so it's about 10 feet off the ground right now. And so uh, I and another, uh, one of Katrina's cousins, have, every time we get together, we talk about this deck that we're going to build on it. And so that is, we've started to order materials. That is one of the things that we're going to start building. Now, nothing like Noah's Ark, okay? But just to give you a, kind of the scope of this, between me and him and my son, which he doesn't have a choice, <laughs> lucky him, um, that he's going to be free labor. Uh, we're building a deck 45 feet long by 10 feet wide. 10 feet off the ground. So for me, this is big stuff. So we've been planning, we've been writing, drawing diagrams, we've been, you know, kind of exploring our options on what's the most inexpensive but structurally sound way, you know, all these kind of things. And we've been going, we've been doing this for almost two years now. And just now we're now going to start building, right? You ever have a plan like that? See, I think too many times in life, God gives us an idea or a passion or a plan of action. However, do we include God in the planning process or the action itself? So I think too often times we get this grand idea, just like for me, I, I've had this grand idea for a deck, but if I just went ahead and started ordering wood and screws and all that kind of stuff and just started building, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be structurally sound, Right? I think a lot of times God gives us an idea and then we go, God, I got this. I got it handled. And then we forget that we're to be and commune with God through the process of it, right? Because only his way is perfect. Our way is faulted. The Lord has prepared everything for his purpose. So maybe in whatever we undertake, we should acknowledge God and his purpose, his will, not ours. And notice in the end, God will seek, not just, seek out not just the wise, but also the wicked. 
the Lord has prepared everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. I, one of the things I wanted to clarify last week, I think that I don't, didn't do a, you, know, you guys know I tend to chase squirrels a lot in my head. You could, if you open my, my brain, you would see all these squirrels going and I'm always chasing them, okay? And I forget which, which tree the last one went up and so I chase the other one. Um, but I made a comment yesterday about a, a Christian comedian that I want to clarify for just a second because I made a comment that um, one, this Christian comedian who was not a Christian, who was an atheist or antagonist before, um, he went out golfing with a Christian and uh, he asked, started talking about God and the, this, this guy said, well, I don't believe in any of that. And I said, the guy told him that he was a moron. And I don't think that I actually finished that. So I want to finish that too. So you can understand that you might have looked at that and gone, well, that's kind of harsh, you know, just calling him names. Well, the reason he said that is because he asked, why are you an atheist? And the guy said, well, I don't know. I just don't believe in all that stuff. No, wait a minute. Then you're not an atheist. Well, yeah, I am. I don't believe it. No, wait. Even atheists have done their research. Even atheists know God's word. They know the Bible. They know they have reasons why they are an atheist. You're just skipping from the end. You just don't even care. That's why he called him a moron. See, one way or another, you have to believe, right? And one thing or another. Verse 5 says, everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. There's a, a show out right now called Ultimate Tag. Have you guys seen this show at all? That's all right. It's one of those weird things that I watch. Anyway, it's kind of like, you guys remember the old show American Gladiators? Kind of similar, except it's all on the premise of, of tag, right? Um, and yesterday when we were watching, we had the, there was this 19 year old kid who got on there. And I mean, this kid could have filled the entire stadium with his ego. I mean, he was so full of himself. It wasn't even funny. And there's this little, one of the taggers who, who's, you know, one of the, you know, the gladiators, if you will, we'll just call her that. She probably stood about half his height and he, in this, she caught him like two or three times. And even at the end, she, he was like, how, how good he did and how he crushed it. And she was just looking at him like, were you playing the same game I was? Right? We got to keep those things in check. You know, we can look back at the Old Testament and find a great example where cities, a city's pride got the best of them. Remember that place called Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. God took care of that pride, didn't he? In fact, if you look back at Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, you might remember seeing some of the things that God hates. Chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. This might be familiar to you because we went through some of this. A heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a false witness, one who stirs up trouble, all of these things are things that God hates, that he despises. You know, there's a great... Go ahead. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. For those of you at home that didn't hear that, Naomi was saying that what she immediately thinks on the, the hands that shed innocent blood, the abortion epidemic... We want to talk about an epidemic. Let's talk about that. Well, let's talk about that. So there's a great fallacy in today's mentality. If only I can change this about myself, then dot, 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 right? I'll be content. I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. Only God can make you content. Only God. Only God can make your steps known. Look at verse 9. In chapter 16, it says, a person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. Uh, any of you ever um, listened to Mark Lowry? 
He's been on one of my favorites, you know, since I was a kid. I just love listening to him. And uh, he took a break there, it seems like, for a while from um, from comedy and from, you know, I think it was the Gaither group that he was with. He took a break from it. And then one of the more recent ones that I saw from him is, as he said that, uh, you know, God really did a number on his heart. And he needed that break. And because in the church, we typically say to other people around us, like, You'd say those, those people who are caught in addiction or sin or of some kind hate the sin but love the sinner, right? And Mark Lowry, in the, one of the later ones that I saw, he said, you know, God, God corrected my heart on that. Because that's, I think in t- times it's kind of a cliche for us that we say, we just say that in passing. But he said, you know, God said, hate your own sin. Stop focusing on everybody else's sin. Hate your own sin and love everyone. Everybody's a sinner. Love everyone. Because we can say, oh, well, I hate the sin, but then, you know, and I love the sinner, but do we really? Do we truly have a compassion or a passion for others? Do we have a passion for the people across the street? Do we have a passion for the people in this town in Grenada? You know, a lot of times we get together and we pray for each other's illnesses, but can I tell you something? Far more important than praying for each other's illnesses is praying for each other's hearts. That we as a body of believers would be used by God. That more people would come to know him. That less people would be shocked when Jesus returns. All right, look at chapter 16, verse 2 and 10 through 11. So in chapter 16, verse 2, it says, All a person's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs Motives. Then go down to 10 and 11. God's verdict is on the lips of a king. His mouth should not give an unfair judgment. Honest balances and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his concern. You know, we cannot fool God what is truly in our hearts. We may be able to fool each other. And I would venture to say all of us in this room have fooled each other from one time or another, right? But we can't fool God. He knows what's truly in our hearts. So how do we check ourselves? Maybe we should ask, is what I'm doing or about to do or focused on meant to please me or the God I serve? The Lord weighs our motives. Verse 10 says, God's verdict is on the lips of a king. His mouth should not give an unfair judgment. In this point in time, the the people believed that the king, whatever the king did or said, truly came from God himself. That was their, their belief system during this time. So anything that Solomon said or conducted in his business to the people, that was, I mean, that, that was from God himself. And then in verse 11, it says, honest balances and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his concern. You know, it's a different type of hypocrisy, I think, that they they knew in that kind of day. There is a lot of, um, we'll just say bad, you know, business people who would take the scales of old. You remember seeing these old scales, right? And that they would purposely manipulate the scales, You know, I would say in today's day and age, I I don't know, maybe it's not just that, but also if we're not counterbalancing those scales on a periodic basis, if we're not doing a double check on whether our scales are honest, then we are being dishonest. It needs to be constantly checked, constantly sought through. It constantly needs to be recalibrated. Your heart needs to be recalibrated. In my, in my case, daily. So what actions can we take to make sure that our motives please the Lord? All right, the last section in the couple minutes we have left, Proverbs 16, 3 and 6 through 7. So in verse 3, it says, commit your activities to the Lord and your plans will be established. And then six through seven, iniquity is atoned for by loyalty and faithfulness, and one turns from evil by the fear of the Lord. When a person's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So verse three is strong, isn't it? Commit your activities to the Lord and your plans will be established. Okay, so we know that God cannot lie, right? We believe that, that God cannot lie. And he cannot mislead us. That is not in his nature to do. So, 
if we commit our activities to the Lord, then our plans will be, what? Established. You know, this seems like such an easy concept, doesn't it? When you, you just say it out loud, it seems like such an easy concept for us. So why do we struggle with it so much? Could it be that because our faith doesn't grow, our dependency on God suffers? When we grow our faith, we cannot help but become more and more consumed with God's ways and not our ways. I look back at just from the time where I was a 20-year-old to the time now I'm 40 plus, all right, and seeming to creep up really quickly now. Um, but anyway, I look back at that and I thought I was pretty wise at that time. But now God has given me much more of a nurture, a, you know, a desire to seek after him. That's why I love Proverbs so much. You guys know this. Proverbs is one of my favorite books in the Bible because there's so much wisdom and there's so much that I learn from it. And each and every day that I learn it or that I, that I read it, I find more and more seeking after not my will, right? Not your will, but his will. The one that makes my steps clear. Commit your activities to the Lord and then rest in his faithfulness. Verse 6 and 7 again, iniquity is atoned for by loyalty and faithfulness, and one turns from evil by the fear of the Lord. When a person's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Forgiveness, one of the most powerful tools that we can use in life to create change. Yep, you heard me right. Forgiveness. You want to create change? Be abundant in your forgiveness. I think we have it backwards. We want to scream and yell and blame. And funny, the more we scream and yell and blame, the worse things get. But have you ever noticed when somebody forgives you, how it changes your heart? It changes your path? It changes your outlook? Sounds like maybe God knew something we didn't, right? God was so loyal to us that he was consumed with ridding us of our sin to the point of sending his son, Jesus. You know, it's funny, though. I wonder if, if the people of the Old Testament might have known it a little bit better than we do. What do I mean by that? They lived on the wrong side of the cross. We lived on the right side of the cross. You'd think that would make us more forgiving because we've been forgiven Solomon says here that our loyalty and fear of the Lord causes a stirring in our hearts when we have done evil, a turning back to God and asking for forgiveness. And God and his great forgiveness com forgives completely, completely. There's no rehashing it, right? You guys ever in your marriage find that there's been something you did wrong 20 years ago and it's rehashed? Yeah. God doesn't do that to us. He doesn't. He forgives completely. He says it's gone. Yeah. Thank God. Notice also, though, in verse 7 that God gives us another blessing. Even our enemies will be at peace with us. You have to see the caveat, though. When a person's ways please the Lord, only then does he make enemies be at peace. When a person's ways please the Lord. So today we've seen all the things that can give us peace and rest and all of them follow the path of a right relationship to God or with God. One that seeks to fear, please, and glorify the one who created all of us. So here's the thing. And we're going to close right here. You want to live better? Trust in God. You want to have, a better, have better relationships? It starts with God and having a right relationship with him. Only then can he correct the pride within us. You want better motivations? Only God can cleanse your heart. You get the point, I think. Only through God can true wisdom be grasped. Let's pray. Our God and Father, I thank you for this time that we're able to open up your word. I ask God that, that you would guide each and every one of our hearts individually. Lord, you know what needs to be done. You know how... Lord, you know where, where our hearts lie. 
And if they don't lie and, and, and glorify in you, Lord, I, I ask and pray for your wisdom that you would guide us into the insight that we well, can only get from you that, that can make our path straight. I praise you, God, for everything that you've done, that you free, freely forgive us, that when we accept Jesus, your son, that you wipe our sin away and that you change us. Lord God, may you help us display a right attitude so that this world might be changed, this community, this neighborhood. Lord, you know. God, indirect us, Lord, that we would glorify you in everything that we do. In your name I pray, amen.